Hey friends, there's something new from our sponsor, Text Control. Their new product, DS Server, provides document services out of the box for all platforms and languages. Whether you want to integrate document creation, editing, sharing, or collaboration into your web app, DS Server provides the back-end technology to integrate that professional document processing. For example, using DS Server, you could integrate an MS Word-compatible document editor into pure JavaScript, Angular, or an ASP.NET Core application. You can create PDF documents using web API calls or even request electronic signatures from end users. DS Server is also hosted on-premise in your infrastructure or with your cloud provider, such as Microsoft Azure. And you can test DS Server without downloading anything. Create your first DS Server application in minutes by requesting a trial token on their dedicated website at dsserver.io. That's DS. S-E-R-V-E-R dot I-O. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. and this is another episode of the Cancel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Johanna Rothman. She's the author of the wonderful packet of books, Modern Management Made Easy. I have all three books, as well as a whole host of other books, on project management, project portfolios, modern management. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad. You know, so I read your your, your three-book series on modern management made easy. You've got Practical Ways to Lead, uh, pr- Practical Ways to Manage Yourself, which I particularly <laughs> liked as a person that thinks about, you know, um, productivity and, like, you know, improving myself first and then improving the team. But I was st- I was stricken by the title of book two, which says practical ways to lead and serve. And you, in, in all of your talks and the things that you publish online, that idea of leadership as service seems to be a theme. Um, it is. And we, we often think about management as something we do to other people. And if mm. we start to, reformulate that as something we do with and in service of other people, I think we get much better results. And I, uh, uh, this is from servant leadership. And I will say th- that when I started to read about servant leadership, I said, oh, this is a little bit icky for me because there's <laughs> a lot of, no, I mean, seriously, there's a lot of people with the religious overtones that talk about servant leadership, and that is not where I'm coming from. But okay. I, I, I am of the experience and of the mind that says, if I support the people who work mm. with me, and I and I create an environment where they can succeed as a team, we are much more likely to succeed altogether. Right. So you're you're calling out that idea that the organization exists to uh, push a a single goal, and it's not that they work to make you successful. It's that you all work as a team, and you're almost yeah. first among equals. Well, and it's possible by by their work, I actually look more successful. Um, mm. Hopefully, that actually works out well. Sometimes mm-hmm. they do as great a job as they can, and we all don't succeed. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That's where the buck stops with me. And we reset and we go on from there. But the mm-hmm. more the more we think about working as a team, the more we think about supporting that overarching goal, the more likely we are to succeed. And you use this word that I think folks who may be listening who may not speak English as their native language may not have in their toolbox, congruence. And you think about congruence and what that means as someone who leads. So congruence is the idea that we balance the needs of ourselves with the needs of the other person in the conversation or the needs of the team for several people and and the context. So think of it as a three-legged um, stool. So if you, if we think about what we need and we only think about what we need and we forget about the other person in the organization or the conversation, we blame the other people, often just for being human. And if we forget about ourselves and we only think of the other person, we placate them. And then if we forget about the context, 
We don't even remember. Why are we doing this thing in the first place? Mm. Why are we doing this thing in the first place is more than just a goal that you're setting as an organization. You call out the importance of uh, value-based leadership and value-based integrity, which is a, really a reset of like, hey, everybody, what are we all doing here? Can we at least agree on some basics? Well, and I find that so many organizations are set up so that they um, actually negate all of our personal values. If we mm-hmm. had to treat people in at the grocery store, in our in our church, in our community, with the way um, with the way our organizations want us to treat each other, we would mm-hmm. not do that, <laughs> right? We would just not do that because it's it's nasty the way a lot of times we make people um, make terrible choices. If I do something for me, I will get my bonus, and if I do work with the other person, I won't get my bonus. How is that even reasonable? Mm. We have a lot of conversations around that at Microsoft, and we've gone so far at my company to formalize the idea that one's success can almost always be based on lifting someone else up and making them more successful, building upon the success of others, is what they call it, so that we have less of that sense of, of competition where it's like it's me versus Joanna as opposed to us building on each other's work. I have found that when I, well, uh, um, especially as a consultant now, but even back when I was inside the organization as a manager, that the more I, I encouraged people and uh, rewarded people for creating a better system, which often Mm -hmm. meant coaching and feedback for other people and not because I was so smart or anybody was so smart. It was much more of a two-way street. So the more we coached each other, the more we offered feedback to each other, the more we created better capability as a team or even as a work group, we all succeeded better. And I have found that when we reward based on that, we get better outcomes and we get better products and better better everything because we're now we're focused on what can people do with our products and services how do we how do we make everybody better there's a lot of talk in the last maybe five or ten years about the difference between feedback which is almost just a you know I have a note and I have an opinion and you can take it or leave it and then coaching which is more kind of inquiry oriented when did that start like in the last five or 10 years where coaching and feedback really became two different things? Well, I actually think that they've been two different things for a long time. When Mm. Esther Derby and I wrote Behind Closed Doors, Secrets of Great Management, we actually called out the difference between feedback and coaching, right? So feedback is offering information in the present about Mm -hmm. the hopefully recent past with an eye towards changing the future. So if you give me feedback or you offer me feedback, I can listen and not do anything. But if I ask you for coaching, you are supporting me with my ability to generate more options. Interesting. More options about what you can do as opposed to feedback, which is saying, this is a thing you're doing and I need you to stop doing it. Or I want you to do more of it. Right. Mm, so yeah. we we often don't remember about reinforcing <laughs> feedback. We, we more remember about change-focused feedback. And while, you know, I, I have received feedback in my, in my life, I received one piece of feedback uh, only about a year and a half into my working life that changed my work life forever. My boss told me I did not finish projects. That was really good to know. And now I have checklists because I really hate to finish. Interesting. You know, I got that feedback a couple of years ago, and that changed things for me, too, where my boss said, I do amazing work, and you're doing a great job, but you get your projects to 85%, and then you kind of fumble the ball. And he's like, I'd like you to just keep running for another 15 yards. Yep. Yeah, he actually told me I got them to 96%. (laughs) <laughs> you, you did far better than I did. Then, I think. No, but but that last four <laughs> yeah. percent. That's the important one. You got to spike the ball. Otherwise, it's not really anything. Right. So um, I, I, I did ask him for some for some more information when I received that feedback. But then 
uh, I did not need coaching to know what to do about that. I only needed to know I needed checklists. So Mm. not everybody needs checklists. I am one of those checklist people. But when I think about coaching, I really think about a time boxed approach to increasing a person's options and therefore capabilities. So it's it's offering options with support. Mm. One of the things that I really liked about the structure of these books, and I would really encourage people to check them out. I'm going to put links in the show notes. You can, of course, find them on Johanna's uh, website as well, is that in each um, chapter, you start out with a myth. And it's not just like a myth where you just made something up and we go like, that's not really a myth. They're like, like literally myths where like, Oh yeah. Wow. you like, that's, I thought that was a real thing. And then you <laughs> proceed to dismantle it completely. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, <laughs> that's because I have either done all of these or mm. lived by them or seen my, uh, my clients fall into these traps. So, mm-hmm. I do not want to write an anti-pattern book. I, you know, I really don't like anti-pattern books, and I apologize to the patterns people who love them. I, (laughs) for me, they don't go anywhere. And I really, one of the things about patterns is that, especially if you start to see them in the organization, you might say, well, Johanna offered me three or four options here, and I don't like those first two. But I can see where that third one, I can make some hay with that third one. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I really wanted people to understand, that we don't always, uh, your experience and context are totally different than mine. So how can I offer you an anti-pattern and then say, oh, no, you must do this thing. No, that does not work. Options that you can consider, yeah, that will work. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the things that struck me that uh, is it's an issue that I'm currently challenged with is I've gone from being what at Microsoft we call an M1 to an M2. So I've gone from a manager, where I have a bunch of people who work for me, to a manager of managers, where the depth of my organization is now going from one to two to three. And uh, in the process, you know, there's there's reorgs and there's movements and things. And then you, one moment you'll have, you know, 12, 13 people on your team. And you just can't have one-on-ones. You can't like your entire day would be just doing one-on-ones with people. So what is the right number of people to manage and how does that change when the org gets deeper and deeper? So this is where um, you would have one-on-ones with the people who, who report directly to you. And I'm, I'm using more traditional language because I don't have better language at this point, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine. So um, if you are a manager of managers, I suspect you have, four or five or six managers who report to you and you would Mm -hmm. have all of them as a team. So you would not do skip level one-on-ones on on a regular basis. You Mm -hmm. might want to on an infrequent basis. Um, I did not address skip level one-on-ones in the, in these books. I have, Mm -hmm. I've had good results and very bad results. So I, I don't know what I would recommend at this point. But I find that if I if I can build up enough trust with the people I work with as a management team, right? So there are the people at who are my peers, and then there are the people whom I serve. So I want to build up that management team, right? The people whom I serve and my peer managers. So those mm-hmm. are two different teams. Do I need to have one-on-ones with my peers? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. I definitely need to have one-on-ones with the people I serve. And if you are serving more than about six or seven or eight managers, I wonder if you should have um, some other level in between. I don't know. It's possible that Mm -hmm. you are, that you don't need more people in between. That's That's one of the reasons that in book two, I really recommended that managers measure their cycle time. How long does it take you to make a decision? And how many times do you have to revisit the issue to make a decision? Mm -hmm. Because if you understand that and you understand where your time goes, you would find 
um, you would have either more or less time for one-on-ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a whole section in book two on how often to meet privately with people, gathering data. And one of the things that I enjoyed about all the books is there's a impl- both implicit and explicit call from you to be introspective at all times. You're 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 not just giving tasks. You know, you're not just managing me, but you are encouraging me to sit down and have a meeting with myself and think about like, what is it I'm doing? What meetings can I get rid of? What's my day look like? And you really focus on measuring results as opposed to measuring time. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I saw a lot of, I still see a lot of measuring time. Um, Every time my clients want to ask, well, um, one of my clients recently said, we need to implement time cards so we can verify that the estimates are accurate. That really struck me wrong on so many levels. So I said, mm-hmm. are you going to make sure that people only write down 40 hours a week or are you encouraging them to write down actual time that they spent on every single thing? Well, mm-hmm. no, we can only write down 40 hours a week. So I said, okay, I can guarantee you that in, under crunch time, you are underestimating by at least 20 or 30 or 40% because you have employed passionate people who really care about getting the job done. This is my experience every single place. So, Mm -hmm. and if you want to know if your estimates are accurate, that's not the way to do it. Time cards are not the solution to that problem, although they look like a solution to that Mm -hmm. problem. So I suggested that instead they measure cycle time and then contrast cycle time with the forecast that they did. And several of my clients have said that was eye-opening because they had no idea that the actual work time, the estimate, the forecast was accurate, whereas the wait times varied wildly. So that's when they got to see it's not what people think the job takes. It's all the delays of this problem in the organization, or I need this person in the organization, or I'm working against that policy. And so mm-hmm. once once we realize what the issues are in the organization, then we can say, oh, maybe this is not the right way to address it. So if I pop back up the stack to your question, <laughs> um, measuring time is interesting. I, I find it very useful to measure my time to make sure I'm not uh, doom scrolling on Twitter, you know, <laughs> all that all that stuff that we might have been doing over the last March that's been lasting, you know, a year and a half. But measuring time for other people, often not that useful. Hmm. And there are, and this is, uh, this conversation started on the second book, but there are echoes of this in the third book where you kind of up level and start talking about managing organizations. Specifically, there's a section on the idea of utilization and why 100% utilization doesn't work for, for people, that it's, it's okay to not be 100% utilized at all times. It's even a great idea not to be 100% utilized because when will you get really interesting ideas, right? Mm. If I'm, if I'm rushing towards finishing something, I might Mm -hmm. have some good ideas and I write them down in my notes application or, you know, everybody has their own little place to write 10 interesting things that occur to them, but Mm -hmm. I can't capitalize on them until I'm done rushing. And we have all seen um, highways that are totally uh, gridlocked. Mm -hmm. We've seen streets that are gridlocked. Those are at 100% utilization. Why would I want to have people I lead and serve? Why would I want to have people who do the job so totally utilized that they can't finish anything and can't think of new and interesting things that we can then capitalize on as a company. Mm-hmm. With cyber attacks on the rise, creating software that's secure is critical to every business's success. Yet 50% of organizations provide developers with security training only once a year, and much of this is often boring, unengaging, and not relevant to your everyday work. Veracode Security Labs offers real world, hands on challenges that gamify secure coding and put your skills to the test in as little as five minutes. You can select from dozens of interactive labs and the most popular programming languages 
You can compete with colleagues and get instant remediation guidance, all at your own pace. Visit veracode.com slash labs, that's V-E-R-A, code.com slash labs today. You can start hacking and patching real apps right away with their complimentary community edition. And you also call out context switching, uh, which which is actually in line with my longtime opinion when I give talks on productivity, that multitasking is a lie. Like we are oriented to do one task at a time and we rarely measure the time for the context switch. You call out that cost specifically. Oh, yeah. When I was doing the work, when I was writing the project portfolio book, um, even the first version of it, I, I, I actually got research and, and data that says context switching can cost us as much or more than the actual work we do. And it, it totally destroys our, our, con, um, our concentration. It makes us think we are never going to finish this thing. Why should I even bother? I mean, it does all these horrible things to our brains. And this is um, back when I was a developer. I, I would lose concentration if somebody walked into the room and hit me on the shoulder and said, hey, Johanna, I would, you know, kind of fly back up and say, what do you, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> and then I would go back into the code and say, what was I doing? I have no idea what I was doing. The worst part is we can, I think we can measure this. Every time I was interrupted as a developer, I created at least one, two, or three more defects, at least. And for managers, mm -hmm. I think that when we when we are busy concentrating and we get interrupted, we lose the thread of where we were going. We make worse decisions. Mm, that is absolutely true. And the decisions that we make, the other thing that you talk about is who has the power to decide. And one of the things that happened today is I had a meeting with my, my boss and we were giving him some feedback. It was a formal moment for us to actually give him feedback. And he uh, said that he viewed his role in an idealized sense that if he could remove himself, then he was a good manager. So rather than making himself the bottleneck, he says he is actively working at all times to remove himself from the equation by enabling us to, to make the decisions, which I thought was, I thought was not his role. It actually changed how I thought about where he fit into the organization. So I think if you know that about your manager, you can, you can work with that. I think that when, I was always very clear with the people I, I led and served that my job was to support them so that they didn't need me in the same role I was in, that I wanted to be able to take on other roles in the organization. Not every manager wants that. I know of some managers who are really happy as a first level dev manager or a first level test manager. They don't want to move quote up. They don't want to move quote over. They are really happy doing what they're doing. However, if they, if they create an environment where other people can, I'm going to say this word quote, surpass them end of quote, they have done their best job. So it's a really interesting problem when we look at the role of a manager and i don't i don't th i don't say i have all the answers for is your boss right i think that as long as he explained his position to you now you mm. can say yeah i know what to do now i understand how to right. how to work with you it's when we when we don't have that api <laughs> sorry um <laughs> <laughs> yep no, you're right. You're talking to the right people because that's exactly right. Without documentation for the API, I don't know what functions I'm supposed to call on this guy. Yeah, I mean, I have had to tell people, um, I am, uh, my man, my calendar runs my day. I organize my day by what's in my calendar. I agree to meetings based on what I want to accomplish, right? So with what do I want to accomplish? I leave these times open. I then, once I get to that day, my calendar runs my day. And when people don't give me a calendar invitation, I, I don't even know what to do with that. So yeah, I have a very firm API. Yep, exactly. That's another thing that's interesting. And that happens to bring us to kind of the idea of managing yourself, which is 
both how you work and how you know others to work, we're really learning that some people want an email. Some people want a text message. Some people don't ever want you to call them. You have to almost keep a catalog of APIs into other people. Well, and I think that that's actually useful. We can Mm. agree as a team or a work group. Here are the two or three ways we will contact each other uh, on a regular basis. And if we have an emergency, we might use this thing. But I... I I had in, um, contacts today from email, Facebook, Slack, WhatsApp, and I think that, oh, there must have been something else. I don't, I don't know. I'm sure that there's, lost- there's, another, there's always another uh, inbox to, to check. Yeah, and I, I find that the more inboxes we allow ourselves at work, the less frequently we check the right ones at the right time. And Mm -hmm. I think that this is a team-based thing. I might, I mean, I already said my API is my calendar. If if I worked with the team and they said, we can't stand that, Johanna. We we really need you to check this particular channel in Slack or, you know, whatever, every single hour. I would learn how to do that. I might not be happy, but I would learn because that is part of our working agreements. So we can have working agreements with our team that override our preferences. But if we don't ever um, explain what those are, if we don't, if we don't find a way to manage our, our time, our words, our everything, we are letting everybody else down. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, maybe the inbox and how we communicate isn't an example of a standard, but you have an entire section where you have very strong opinions on on imposing things upon organizations. And when is it time to impose a standard, a policy, or a procedure? And when can that be problematic and remove autonomy, keep people from thinking, and basically make a system even more brittle than it already was? Oh, yeah. I find so. Um, several of my clients have said, we want to go agile. That I think that this is a great thing. And uh, almost every one of them has said, we want to use this particular framework. It does not matter which framework it is. They all choose a different framework, but they assume that they can choose for other people. This business of limiting autonomy and especially not understanding the context of a team, I never mm-hmm. understand that. So in the books, I gave these example of of this one R&D company where engineering um, did mostly product work. The security people did mostly interruption work with some um, regular care and feeding of the security infrastructure. And then there were people who opened offices. They were all part of this one large organization called either IT or engineering or something. I don't don't even remember. And when, when I explained to the senior leadership that Every single team did something different. And why would they use the same approach for each different context? That's mm-hmm. when they started to get that, oh, uh-huh. Yeah, maybe that's not such a good idea. Yeah, that is a complicated <laughs> complicated thing to figure out. But I think the point you're making is you need a safe organization to have these conversations and decide whether or not a standard is beneficial or whether it's removed autonomy and then damaged the organization itself. Well, and if you're safe enough to disagree with people nicely, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we need to use words, Johanna, we need to use words that other people can hear. But I think it's really important that we can disagree. If somebody else says, you will use this approach for almost anything, and you will like it, mm, that does not really work that well. (laughs) And you'll like it. You'll love it. Oh yeah, because now we got the agile thing, or now we got the the whatever whatever. Um, this is where management fads come from, right? Mm-hmm. When managers say, "Oh, my golfing buddy," or "I saw this in HBR," or "I read it on on a plane." Well, I know nobody's on planes. Or I read it in a small little management book that talked about mice and cheese or something. If they if they do that and impose something on the rest of the organization that they do not understand the implications of. It definitely removes autonomy and most likely removes the ability of people to actually get the work done that the organization needs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in the in the book on um, managing yourself, and again, this packet, these books that we've been talking about are part of a package of three books, and I'll have a link in the show notes called Modern Management Made Easy. It's both leading yourself, leading others, and then leading entire organizations. One of the sections that I really liked was a part on uh, are you allowed to make mistakes? You know, having a safe place for you to make a mistake as a manager and then in, in, uh, creating a, a safe environment for your people to make mistakes. So I think that the first time I had to say, I don't know, in a senior leadership meeting, I got all sweaty. <laughs> I I was not sure what would happen to me if I said, I don't know. And then I have made some doozies of mistakes as as an individual contributor and as a manager. And mm-hmm. every single time I actually admitted it, and I admitted it fast, that was better than if I tried to cover it up. Because it's not so much the mistake that's a problem. And the, well, mistakes are always problems. It's our reactions to them. And so the more the more we try and cover it up, the more we try mm-hmm. and sweep it under the rug, the more we try and do all these things, the less anybody trusts us to do anything else again. Mm-hmm. So uh, and if we don't feel safe to say either, I screwed up, I don't know, I made a mistake, whatever it is you need to say, that's an insufficient level of safety for almost anything we want to do at work. Mm -hmm. That is a good place to end because you've given me a lot to think about. And I want to encourage the folks that are listening to go and explore jrothman.com slash books, because it's not just these three books that I'm excited about because I just read them, but uh, books that you've been writing over many, uh, many years. You have created almost a library of management books, uh, both by yourself and then with others. Yes. I, I never thought I would be a writer. <laughs> and I started to write books because my clients needed to know how to do these things. So I wrote them down. Self-documenting, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Johanna Rothman, for chatting with me today. And thank you so much for having me, Scott. I really enjoyed it. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 